Good morning and welcome to Surgery Grand Rounds. There is no commercial support for today's program. The speaker and planners have disclosed no relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests. If you have a question for the presenter, please hold until the Q&A segment at the end of the talk. If you are attending virtually, you may enter your question into the chat section. A link to the event survey will be shared at the end of the program. And if you are an um, ABS certified physician and want NGHS to report your CME credits to the ABS, please fill out the evaluation and give us permission to do so. It is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Dylan Schwent graduated from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and is currently a fifth year resident within the Northeast Georgia Medical Center general surgery program. He plans to return to rural Missouri and serve the community of Bolivar, Missouri as a general surgeon with his wife and two girls starting in August of 2025 post-graduation. Join me in welcoming Dr. Schwent. All right, so I'm going to be talking about adrenal lesions today. So whenever we identify these on CT scans or any various ways of imaging, what do we, what do, we do next? So you'll see this little adrenal guy come through, but we got a lot to cover, so I'll get going. So no disclosures. If anyone has some money laying around and wants me to disclose something, I'd love that. So first thing that we're going to do is provide a definition of what adrenal incidentalomas are. So definition, an adrenal incidentaloma, so it's a mass detected on any radiographic image performed for an indication that is suspect that is other than suspected for adrenal disease. So very common way that we would see this, patient comes in as a trauma, they get pan scanned, you find a, a lesion. So what do you do with it? So since the 1980s, CT scans have definitely became more prevalent. So their widespread use has definitely increased the amount that incidentalomas of various organs have been identified. So specifically for adrenal incidentalomas, 8% um, of autopsies will show uh, these incidentaloma lesions, and uh, one to seven percent, with most of the studies saying around four percent, is how prevalent these are on uh, imaging studies. So definitely prevalent. And then specifically, as you get on an age, um, if you're above the age of 60, it can be one in 10 patients having an adrenal lesion. So we think of our trauma patients coming in ground level fall. Just you get 10 trauma activations. One of those may have this. So it's a Definite big clinical problem. So what do we do with it? So uh, potential etiologies of adrenal le lesions, and then um, we're going to talk about imaging characteristics. So specifically um, with the etiologies, there's a wide variety of pathologies with adrenal lesions. You'll see the majority of what uh, it is, is it's going to be a non-functioning adenoma. So it's going to be benign. Um, you're going to have majority of these not necessarily needing an adrenalectomy. But there, we'll talk about the indications for surgery and everything here in a little bit. But just know that of the different things, most of them are going to be benign. So you have to think benign versus malignant, and then if it's functioning or non-functioning. So imaging studies, the two main things that you're going to look at is the size and the imaging characteristics. So size, that all relates to adrenal cortical carcinoma, or I'll refer to it as ACC. So the carcinoma, the adrenal gland size definitely plays a factor. So you see over here the different um, percentages. If it's less than four centimeters, it's, it's not very likely, less than 1% to be a cancer. But as you start going up in size, cancer can be a possibility for a primary lesion of the adrenal. So four to six centimeters, uh, 5% and then greater than six centimeters, a 35% rate for an adenoma or an adrenal lesion becoming an adrenocortical carcinoma. So part of the indications, and you take this with a grain of salt and we'll allude to why, but four centimeters is your cutoff. So four centimeters, you have a 90% sensitivity for detecting an adrenal carcinoma. So whenever you're talking about adrenalectomies with these patients, of course, four centimeters, you have a 5% risk of malignancy, but whenever you make that four centimeter cutoff size, you're less likely to miss these lesions. So size decision-making, 
four centimeters in every single patient, do you do an adrenalectomy? No, you got to take it with a grain of salt and figure out, is this clinically indicated and take each patient and individualize their care. So a 4.5 centimeter lesion in an elderly patient with all the benign features that we'll talk about what that looks like, you can observe these. You don't have to get excited and take them to the OR, even though we love taking them to the OR, but they don't necessarily have to have an adrenalectomy just because they're four centimeters or greater. Um, stability over time definitely has to be considered in your evaluation of risk for malignancy. So a five centimeter lesion if it's been present for many, many years, and a lot of times what will happen is you'll get a, someone will have a CT scan, the radiologist may not call the adrenal lesion, but it's been like five centimeters or say, and then the next five, 10 years later, they get a CT scan and that radiologist says, okay, I see an adrenal lesion, they compare it. If it's been five centimeters for many, many years, it's not likely to be a malignancy, it can. So you have to have that individualized discussion with your patient. But malignant lesions staying the same size for more than six months is less likely. But the alternative to that is you see a three centimeter lesion. It's not the four centimeters, but if it wasn't present on imaging a year ago, okay, that's definitely suspicious for malignancy. So exception to the size recommendation, adrenal myolipomas. These have very specific imaging characteristics. It's kind of like this marbling kind of appearance. So what these can present with is pain, mass effect, rupture, bleeding. And we actually had one on our hepatobiliary service about a month ago that we took a left adrenal lesion that was a myolipoma. And the patient had not necessarily mass effect, but was having pain and had some bleeding components of it. So these can be really big and we'll get to the different approaches for surgery. Mainstay is definitely gonna be your laparoscopic or robotic. And it can kind of depend on size, but you can take these out. We took out a um, like 13 centimeter one with robotically just a month ago, which was pretty fun to be a part of. So imaging features, talk about size. Now you gotta talk about the features. So characterizing lesions, a lot of patients will already have CT scans and then they come to see you. Um, but benign adenomas, they contain a significant amount of intracellular fat. So we'll talk about Hounsfield units on the next slide, but benign has a specific feature and malignant has a specific feature. So the more dense or attenuating a lesion is, lower fat content, more likely to be malignant. And then we'll get into why you do more imaging. But for anyone that doesn't know some of the new interns, Hounsfield's units or HU, these are a quantitative measure that describe radio density. So you have your scale here, 50 shades of gray, you kind of understand what different densities are on CT scan. So a less than 10% fat is not very um, attenuating, so it's not gonna have a high Hounsfield unit. So being lipid rich or really fatty adenoma, these are very much so characterized as a benign adenoma. And you can be comfortable and we'll get to what that means for future screening, and um, like if surgery is indicated and such, but know that Hounsfield units plays into your next part. So size and then imaging characteristics. If it's over 10, it's not fatty tissue, it's lipid poor is what we classify that as. It's more likely to be malignant, but also they can be benign. So the 30% of benign adenomas are lipid poor. Majority, they're gonna be that less than 10, but over 10, they're still, the some of them that can be benign. But that should be a red flag that, hey, this is not something that we need to just watch. So a uh, contrast washout, once you've identified what, how uh, radio dense it is or how attenuating it is, if it's over the 10 for Hounsfield units, you're going to do a contrasted um, scan. So you get a portal venous phase and a delay, and they have a specific uh, adrenal protocol that you do the non-contrasted scan first, and then you're able to do um, a portal venous phase, and then you wait like 15 minutes and do um, a delayed phase. So benign adenomas are gonna take the contrast up really fast and then give it away. But malignant lesions, they're gonna enhance rapidly as well, so take it up fast, and then they retain it a little bit more, and we'll show some images and why um, 
what the features are. But a contrast washout of greater than 50% is very sensitive and very specific for characterizing a benign adenoma. So here, for your benign etiologies, you said this is 30%, this is the 70%. If it's over 10 for the Hounsfield units, you're gonna do your contrasted. And if it has that greater than 50% washout, which you can measure the Hounsfield units, you're gonna do it in the portal venous and then the delay. If it has that greater than 50% difference, you know it's a benign lesion. You're still gonna follow these. You may not follow these potentially, and we'll get to why. But if it does not have that rapid washout, it's malignant potentially, or a metastatic lesion. All right, so differentiating between top and bottom. Top, we're describing benign, and the bottom, we're describing more of a malignant feature. So over here, oops. Over here, these are your non-contrasted scans, portal venous, and then these are your uh, delayed phases. So right here is your lesion. Whenever you give the contrast, you notice the architecture of it changes and it becomes very attenuating with the, or it becomes um, more enhanced with the contrast on the portal venous phase. So completely um, more fatty. Now it has the contrast and then it's completely looking more so like the original. So it has a 50% contrast difference between those two. And then if, whenever you're measuring it yourself, you can actually see the 50% difference. You just have to take my word for it for this. Um, Non-contrasted scan here, portal venous. So the lesion, um, it's really hard to see probably here, but believe me, <laughs> there's more contrast, especially kind of in that bottom area. And then you see that rim again. So between those two, there's not as much of a contrast washout. So that's considered potentially more of a malignant lesion. And we'll get into what to do with those. So size, imaging features, if it's over uh, four centimeters for an adrenal lesion, you can um, suspect that this could be an ACC, uh, non-contrasted scan greater than 20, and then other features that you may see is ill-defined borders, necrosis, calcifications, or hemorrhage. But then also anyone under the age of 18, you kind of think, okay, that's odd for someone of that age range to have it. So they could have uh, adrenal cortical carcinoma for having an adrenal lesion. But then metastatic, this is really important whenever you're seeing a patient for these lesions to ask them, do you have a personal history of cancer because we'll get into what different types can metastasize to the adrenal gland, but that very much so what you're seeing could be a metastatic lesion. So I'll refer to this slide several times, but going through so far what we've talked about is size less than four centimeters or greater than four centimeters. If it has the imaging features that it's either malignant or indeterminate, you're gonna do an adrenalectomy for that over four centimeter size with the caveats we talked about. Um, more so for size, not the features. And then um, if it's less than four centimeters, non-functioning, which we'll get into the function part, with benign features, then you can just continue to follow them. Recent guidelines are showing that this, even in a lot of your review books, will say every three to six months you get a CT scan, that has a high, high cost to it. So, you know, incidental lesions, majority of these are not gonna have surgery. If you're just doing CT scans repeatedly, they've looked at it, what, what plays out in literature for being beneficial to continue to screen these. And the most recent guidelines are actually saying, you don't have to continue to get CT scans. If it is less than 10 um, Hounsfield units, more benign features, and it's less than four centimeters but you do need to continue to screen them with the labs. So now we'll get into some of that. So fine needle aspiration biopsy. Here's your little adrenal gland saying, please stop, don't, don't stick a needle in me. So we don't necessarily need, well, we definitely do not need an FNA if you have all the features that we just talked about. Size, um, the features on the imaging, if it's benign or malignant. We're, um, biopsies really play the greatest role is whenever you have history of potential metastasis being in, in question. So if they have personal history of cancer, 
and this is a new lesion, you may get a biopsy to confirm if that is a metastatic lesion or not. So one of the studies that I read was a retrospective analysis that um, cytopathology from these FNAs are just not helpful in distinguishing benign and malignant lesions. So do not put your patient through it because it is not benign. You can get hematomas, pain, error and delay in diagnosis if you're not getting the actual tissue, um, inadvertent biopsy of a pheo. Patients can actually die from that. You get severe hypertension. We'll get what pheochromocytomas are in a little bit, but increased difficulty of adrenalectomy, scarring potentially. But um, your adrenalectomy needs to be based on your clinical, biochemical, and radiology assessment as opposed to sticking a needle in it and seeing what it is. All right, so framework for biochemical screening and diagnostic evaluation. So you're gonna evaluate functionality of the tumor. So we talked about size, now we're gonna talk about diagnostic evaluation and biochemical um, parts of this. So history of any malignancy, these are lung, kidney, breast, GI tract, or melanomas are most common to go to the adrenal gland. So it's very important to screen for that before just saying, okay, this is a different etiology. And then your physical exam and um, history is very important. So you're gonna look at physical appearance. You get a lot of information from the patient for especially these hormone-driven type um, etiologies for functioning adrenal lesions. And we'll get into the specific ones that go along with that. But biochemical screening, so after you've gotten your imaging, you have deemed that this patient, well, everyone needs to get their biochemical uh, screening as well. So hormone assessment is critical for your workup of adrenal lesions. Um, as biochemically active lesions, they automatically mandate resection. So you're gonna get metanephrines, um, dexamethasone suppression test, and then an aldosterone renin activity level. Again, going back to this, any size with functioning adrenalectomy after you pre-op, and we'll get into some pre-op stuff too. So functioning adrenal tumors, the three we're gonna talk about, hypercortisolism, hyperaldosteronism, and a pheo. So back in med school, I love the osmosis. It gives you something visual. I'm a very visual person. So seeing this, this is what Cushing syndrome looks like. So hypercortisolism, the adrenal lesion secreting excess uh, cortisol. You have moon facies, buffalo hump, muscle wasting, stretch marks. And the, some of the ones that we kind of forget about to ask, these are all physical features, but osteoporosis, thinning of the bone, that can be a sign of um, extra cortisol being involved, but we'll get into some of these. So labs, dexamethasone suppression test, um, adrenocortic or an ACT, H, uh, urinary cortisol level, and midnight uh, solitary cortisol level. You don't get all of these right off the bat. We'll get into which ones you do and when, but diagnostic evaluation, look at your patient, look at their labs, see if they have hypercortisolism. So for people that don't know, dexamethasone suppression test, they take a milligram, and then the night before, they take the medicine, and then the next morning, they check a cortisol level. So the values are important. If it's less than 1.8, you don't have it. If you have this 1.8 or greater, but at 5, this gets into something that we'll talk about next. But the, if it's over 5, you have hypercortisolism. So mild autonomous cortisol secretion. Some people refer to this as like subclinical um, hypercortisolism, but max for short, this is whenever you have biochemical evidence of cortisol, but no overt stigmata of what you would see with Cushing's. So this is um, another indication for adrenalectomies in some cases. So the most freak, this will be more likely the most frequent hormone abnormality that you'll detect too. So if you have one or more of the following effects of an ACTH independent cortisol secretion, you're going to have hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, obesity, osteoporosis, and atherosclerosis, potentially. So you screen the patients for if they have any of these. And then in a meta-analysis that I read of 17,000 patients, of the patients with a max being the greater than 1.8 um, cortisol level after the dexamethasone suppression test, they had a higher prevalence of diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia whenever you compare it to people that also have an adrenal adenoma. 
So you obtain, um, after you do your dexamethasone test, you also get um, your DHEAS and confirm with a urinary test and then an ACTH in your serum. And then sometimes you don't always have to, and a lot of the places that I was reading or hearing podcasts, you don't necessarily do the dexa or the high um, dose testing as much anymore. But adrenalectomy is recommended for these patients, especially if they have an adrenal lesion over three centimeters and they're medically fit. So retrospective studies are showing that if you do undergo an adrenalectomy, a lot of them will experience um, improvement of their symptoms. And that's for Max. So now hyperaldosteronism, a lot of <laughs> a lot of endocrinology this morning. We'll go through it quick. But renin aldosterone, um, with that axis, you can have a lot of hypertension. There's specific lab values, low sodium or low uh, potassium. So what you're going to get diagnostic evaluation wise is labs check for the low potassium level, see um, fluid retention and hypertension. So these patients are gonna be uncontrolled hypertension and you get those labs, you get your renin aldosterone and that ratio. So to be able to do the testing, just kind of to breeze through this very quickly, you need to be off of the medicines like mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists for six weeks. Otherwise your test is not gonna be um, worthwhile. So that's spironolactone, ACE inhibitors, diuretics or beta blockers can affect the test. But if it's the ratio is high and they're not taking those, then you need to get some confirmatory testing. So confirmatory testing, a couple ways you do it, either have the patient eat a high, high amount of sodium, they go like burgers, fries, or you can go ahead and load them with um, liters of isotonic saline and then check your aldosterone. But if you don't have suppression, that indicates that you have primary hyperaldosteronism. All right, so testing, once you confirm it, then now is this because of the, the lesion, a unilateral adenoma, or is it from bilateral adrenal hyperplasia? So to ensure your laterality, you get very thin cut adrenal CT scans. A lot of patients will just have a trauma scan, or whatnot. If they, whatever scan they got, you need to make sure you're getting an adrenal protocol to make sure it's the thin cuts. And then you may do adrenal vein sampling because say they have two lesions, you don't necessarily know, is it the larger lesion that could be benign or causing this, or is it the smaller lesion? And sometimes you obviously don't want to take out the wrong adrenal gland and then you're like, well, well darn, <laughs> you have to go chase the other one too. But yeah, a few chromocytomas going through these. Remember the genetic mutations, the men syndromes for testing, but your adrenal medulla is where these are produced and it's the catecholamines. So you get very specific um, like symptoms from this. So hypertension, um, sudden severe headaches, palpitations, sweating, anxiety, and tremors. So these are paroxysms that patients will exhibit whenever they have a FEO potentially. So you're gonna get uh, plasma-free metanephrines. So part of that, these can be um, falsely uh, positive. So it's a very sensitive test, 96%, but it, it's not as specific sometimes. So 85% sensitive or spe specificity. So what can cause this to be a false positive? Cold remedies, um, sometimes they're started on phenoxybenzamine. If they're suspected, that can affect it. Um, acetaminophen even, or tricyclic antidepressants, and then just being stressed. So like if you probably check mine right now, I'd probably be elevated. <laughs> um, another part of the adrenal gland, the cortex part is sex hormone secretion. So you're gonna have a very typical uh, patient if their physical appearance that's gonna be more for this. So I'm just kind of breeze through that because the other three are definitely more exciting and important. So now we talked about all that, let's talk about surgery because we love surgery. So indications for your adrenalectomy, we've gone through this, so I'll go kind of quick. Anything that's hormonally active, if you have an inactive tumor over four centimeters with the indeterminate and or indeterminate image findings, you're gonna do an adrenalectomy. 
if you have rapid growth rate, we'll talk about how what the indications for that are in a minute. And then known or suspected adrenal adenocarcinoma, myolipoma, as we talked about, only if they're symptomatic, they can get as, as big as they want, but until they have the symptoms, you don't necessarily need to take them out. And then uh, definitely any metastatic lesions, potentially if with all of the other things, depending on what cancer it is. Um, so adrenal, we're going through this one more time. So we talked about biochemical evaluation. We talked about the potential for malignancy. So that gets you down here. Talked about the size and benign features. You're going to probably surveil these, or you will surveil these. Um, any size with functioning. We'll talk about pre-op, but adrenalectomy. If you do a four centimeter nodule or that has these indeterminate features or has malignant features, adrenal. And then we talked about myolipoma. It's symptomatic, adrenalectomy. If it's not, observe them. All right, perioperative management. So it's very, very, very critical to success of your adrenal operation. So being on the HPV service right now, pre-op is everything. So you wanna make sure that these patients are as optimized as possible before you're going to go to surgery with these patients because they can have hormonal complications and you want the patient to do the best. So talk about these specific um, hormonal types. Theos, they love asking these on test questions. These are kind of exciting to read about. So one to three weeks pre-op, you're going to start them historically on an alpha adrenergic receptor blockade. Phenoxybenzamine really has kind of fallen out of favor because it is very expensive and patients hate taking it because it can make you very symptomatic. Another big reason why we don't use this anymore is post-op, it gets, because it is non-selective, it gives you wider variations in your blood pressure and they're more likely to stay in the ICU for a longer period of time. So it becomes costly. I mean, most of these adrenal lesions you take out, they can go home the next day. With this, if you're using that, it can keep them there for several days, not only in the hospital, but in the ICU because they have wide swings of um, blood pressure after. Um, doxis, doxazosin or prazosin, these are more so what we see now used, and it's a selective alpha-1. So how do you start these? You'd start it up titrate to orthostatic hypotension, and then they remain on that until surgery. So other things you can have pre-op that you would manage is like hypertensive crisis. You can start these drips. Uh, consider a beta adrenergic blockade if after you've started, well, you have to do it after you start alpha. Like that's a very common question and definitely important in practice. So you start your beta after the alpha if they have tachycardia arrhythmias or uh, persistent hypertension. So interestingly, you actually have them do a very high salt um, load right before surgery because intravascularly they're depleted with everything going on. So that can help counteract exactly what is the physiology behind it to optimize them for surgery. So as we get to the OR, it's very, very, very important to talk to anesthesia. This is one of those cases that constant communication with anesthesia is, you have to have it. So two phases of the operation, before vein gets ligated and after the vein gets ligated. Before, the patient's gonna have hypertension, tachycardia, potentially arrhythmias, and these are worse whenever you're inducing physiologic stress on them. So intubation, insufflating the abdomen, and then any manipulation of the tumor. So anesthesia will have these infusions and boluses ready, and they'll be adjusting that all throughout the case. So saying, okay, before I'm ligating the vein, whatever you're on, we're about ready to ligate the vein because there's gonna be a drastic change. So after you ligate the vein, the patient gets significant hypotension. So you're gonna either do fluids, pressors, but you're gonna have anesthesia conversations to get the patient through that part. And this is typically why they stay in the ICUs, getting all their blood pressure back under to normal tension. So post-op alpha blockade, you discontinue it, and then you monitor for hypotension and hypoglycemia as well. So hypercortisolism, pre-op optimization, they have metabolic effects of their cortisol secretions, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, 
and a lot of them are deconditioned, the proximal muscle wasting and such. So get them on an exercise regimen, get them as physically fit and ready, obviously control their diabetes. You talk about um, everything with the patient and make sure that they're ready and safe to do surgery. So preoperative prophylaxis, because of the things that they have for their medical comorbidities, they're at a higher risk for DVTs. So start them on a prophylaxis pre-op, increase wound complications with their diabetes. So preoperative antibiotics is important. And then they can also get stress ulceration, and it's very important to start uh, PPIs post-op. So then after surgery, once you remove the lesion, quite a few patients will have adrenal insufficiency, and they may have to have supplemental glucocorticoids. A test that you can do on post-op day one is an ACTH stimulation test, and this can predict the need for the steroid supplementation. All right, and then hyperaldosteronism, you started a mineralocorticoid beforehand, and then it may need some potassium supplementation. Post-op, closely monitor blood pressure. In a lot of cases, these patients don't come off all of their medications. Like if they're on five, you may end up being able to only wean to like one or two, but they have vascular remodeling and other things that may be attributing to that. So post-op day one, also with this one, you check a test, and this one is your serum potassium and check an aldosterone level, because that shows that you have biochemical response from it. So surgical approaches to your adrenal. Now I finally get to talk about the really exciting stuff. Um, laparoscopic adrenalectomy, different approaches. So different surgeons have different approaches. Uh, transperitoneal versus ret retroperitoneal. The way that I would probably do this in practice is a transperitoneal uh, robotic approach, but the retroperitoneal approach is very cool. Dr. Machado is starting these here, and it, it's a very cool case to see. So we'll get into some pictures and what exactly that looks like, but very, very cool case and that we're getting, not everywhere does it, so that we're getting to see it. It's a great addition to our training. So randomized control trial showed that if you do the retroperitoneoscopic approach, you actually have reduced pain, faster recovery than laparoscopic approach. A lot of it's surgeon dependent and how you're trained. So it, one way or the other, you're gonna do it the way that you feel most comfortable. But we'll get into what the retroperitoneoscopic looks like. And then where open adrenalectomies come into play, um, in Europe, they still sometimes for the early stage lesions will do laparoscopic, but in America we need to do an open approach for any cancer concern because you have early recurrence um, even if you think that you've had a R0 resection and it's usually local and in the tumor bed so it can be from capsule tearing or something is kind of the suspected reason so doing an open approach you know you're getting it out very well all right so to go through left versus right so the patient is in a left lateral position, so the side that you're working on up, and then you're working, you find the inferior phrenic vein, work down, and then it drains into the renal vein, and you're gonna eventually take all the arteries with ligature, however, whatever modality, robotic, it's the uh, either a synchroseal or vessel sealer, and then eventually you clip your, your vein, and then take out the specimen. That's kind of a very quick overview of it, but for sake of time. Um, then a right, right side up. Sometimes you use a fan retractor, but with a left, the inferior phrenic vein is an important landmark to find and find the aorta and the kidney. And that's how you, in patients with like uh, Cushing's, they have more retroperitoneal fat. So it's kind of hard sometimes to identify exactly where the adrenal is in that space. So that inferior phrenic vein is kind of your saving grace on finding the adrenal. For a right, it's your IVC. So if you can find that, then you know it's just lateral to it, unless there's some aberrant anatomy. But that's on a right side, that's what's most important is identifying it and staying away from it. So retroperitoneoscopic adrenalectomy. So they go on... Um, they go prone in a special uh, prone table called a coward, um, what is it? It's coward um, frame, but 
basically how it works is you mark your midline, mark your paraspinous muscle, and then there's three small incisions right off the border of the 12th rib. So the little red part, pretend that's your kidney, this being the adrenal gland and the IVC. So that's what we're looking at, kind of working up for this image. So lesion, adrenal gland, you're gonna do ligature all the way around until you find your IVC and your blunt dissecting working into this space off the anterior border of the kidney. From posterior approach, the liver, spine, paraspinous muscles, identify the IVC and you're gonna ligate your vein. But very cool approach. Some parts of the pitfalls of this is obviously you're working in a much smaller space, but where this comes into play really well for patients is if they have multiple abdominal surgeries, it's a hostile abdomen, they've got mesh, you don't even have to enter the abdomen for this. It's very quick, very cool way to do the adrenalectomy. And then open, so we kind of already hit some of these of the landmarks to find for a right versus a left, but you can approach this either with a midline incision or a subcostal incision. But you can also do even a retroperitoneal approach open. All right, so surgical principles of adrenalectomy. Don't manipulate the adrenal mass if you don't have to. Dissect um, the surrounding tissue away from the adrenal gland and then ligating your arteries and vein. All right. So now following lesions. So what do you do for the ones that are benign, less than four centimeters, they, they're not gonna be needing an adrenalectomy. So these are what you're gonna traditionally, most of the review books say three to six months for two years scans. But to save costs, now the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons and cost and seeing what the data shows on conversion or detecting an adrenal cortical carcinoma for cost effectiveness, they are saying you don't need to do imaging for those two years. You can, you have to screen for biochemical functionality, but you don't have to increase the healthcare costs as long as it's less than 10 pounds field units and less than four centimeters. So if they ever increase in size or have evidence of hormonal secretion, that is now an indication to take it out. So of the most common ones, autonomous cortisol secretion is one that you can identify the most commonly. So have that in the back of your mind as you're screening, that's definitely the one to look for. And it's the most common for them to develop while you're surveilling these. So most non-functional adrenal nodules with those benign characteristics, 10% will grow one centimeter in two to five years. So they don't have a high growth rate, but if there's um, insufficient data, well, there is insufficient data sometimes to recommend specific criteria for nodule growth rate for adrenalectomy. But if you're um, considering adrenalectomy, that's whenever the nodule grows more than two centimeters from whenever they first had an image or a size greater than one centimeter in 12 months. So that's a good indication for resection. We talked about that quite a bit. All right, follow up. So once you've taken the adrenal gland out, what do you do? So ensure pathology report, you got what you went to the OR suspecting. Um, patients, not just the adrenal gland, but the things that it secretes, like and making sure if you think it's a myolipoma or an adenoma with these um, hormone functions, make sure it is what you think you were going for. Uh, patients with FEOs, you have NCCN guidelines that you're gonna follow for this. So for three months post-op, you did uh, H&P, blood pressure and labs. And then after that, for the first three years, every six to 12 months, four to 10 years annually. So the important part and why we follow these is because 16% can come back and it can be five to 10 years later. It's not always right, like the two years in. So definitely gotta keep following these. Uh, hypercortisolism, we talked about the steroid therapy post-op. Uh, they need to, endocrinologist is gonna be your best friend with this. So because their axis is not fully recovered, it can take up to six to 18 months before you get the patient to 
secrete that back on their own. And then hyperaldosteronism, you come off the blood pressure medications as much as you can. All right, so two articles of interest. So to go through them, both of these kind of talk about the radiology um, influence on, because how these typically present for an incidentaloma, gums in trauma scan or et cetera, has this lesion, how effective are we at actually getting them to follow up? And the answer is pretty poor. One of the studies, the second one says it was like a fourth of the patients actually made it through to get their biochemical screening and uh, follow-up imaging if indicated. So this study talks about the radiology report language. That's kind of like a, well, absolutely. If the radiologist tells you to do biochemical screening and follow-up imaging, of course, whoever is reading the image is like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Thank you, radiologist. So making sure that the language of what an adrenal lesion is in the radiology report is very important, and that's what they were showing in this one. But the one that I thought was really cool is automated extraction of nodules from your um, EHR. So in the future, with AI technology being able to do word processing, like Epic will eventually be able to say adrenal lesion or adrenal incidentaloma identified and automatically like flag that for let's do labs, let's do the um, surveillance imaging, it'll, it'll flag it, kind of like those. In clinic, we see the BPA best practice advisories for hypertension. That's where this is headed eventually. It's going to be able to process the information and say, we've identified a patient that needs the surveillance and do that, because right now we're, we're pretty bad at it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Schwint. Uh, my question is going to be about... Um, uh, managing the risk of an adrenal cortical carcinoma versus uh, the risks of a an adrenalectomy. Um, you know, a few years ago, I had asked a friend of mine, or a friend of mine had approached me uh, a case of um, metastatic adrenal cortical carcinoma, and we were trying to figure out what best to do. And my easy answer was, oh, you know, just look at NCCN guidelines; it'll be fine. Do whatever they tell you to. Mm -hmm. Uh, turns out there are no NCCN guidelines for adrenal cortical carcinoma. It's such a rare disorder. Uh, and, um, oh, and when we look at outcomes for adrenal cortical carcinoma, uh, using pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma as a benchmark, which is supposed to be a horrible cancer to have, mm -hmm. um, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma has a uh, disease-free, median disease-free survival of somewhere around 40% over three years. Um, uh, has... Uh, 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 adrenal cortical carcinoma, on the other hand, has a 50% uh, disease-free survival over one year, has an overall survival of about uh, 30 to 40% over a course of three years, uh, which is significantly worse compared to pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So now that I think about how bad the cancer is, and perhaps some of our staff members can answer this too, uh, and when I then think about how risk free or low risk the operation is, why shouldn't I just do an adrenalectomy on every incidental? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so part of why the four centimeter cutoff is being the 90%. So the reason we don't do every, every single adrenal is, of course, it's not without risk. So you have to individualize to the patient. So if it's a four centimeter nodule and they're elderly or not medically fit, you wouldn't necessarily always have to offer them surgery. But to your point, I think in the definite medical fit, great patient to operate on, you're definitely going to remove it. But Hi, Dr. Schwinn. Thanks for that presentation. That was very thorough, and it was a lot of endocrinology, as you said. Yes. So very quick, before I ask you the question, just to answer what Dr. Jackson was saying, the problem with adrenal cancers is he just told you how dismal the outcomes are. It's exactly why we are so aggressive for a lesion that has a 5% risk of malignancy. For most other cancers that have good outcomes, like, for example, thyroid cancer that we deal with, we're not operating on nodules that have a 5% risk of cancer. Right. The only time I think that would change is 
for a patient who is so significantly at risk from the operation or has other comorbidities where the surgery itself would be the most challenging thing that they go through, those are like rare cases where we say we're not going to operate on something that's between four to six centimeters. Um, but the vast majority of them, you will take them to surgery, and it's for that specific reason. Um, my question for you is more along the lines of financial toxicity with adrenal incidentaloma. So you've kind of shown us that there's this whole you know, host of patients that are getting unnecessary CT scans, unnecessary biochemical evaluations, right? Once you get your initial imaging, if it's non-functional, realistically, the only biochemical screening they need is cortisol. They don't need to get repeat metanephrines. They don't need to get a repeat aldosterone metan ratio. And they don't need to get 5,000 CT scans. Right. So what's a way that we can approach this as a system where we set something up in place where we're making sure we're catching that balance between identifying all these and then putting the system and patients out of pocket? Mm -hmm. I think just having inter interdisciplinary discussions with primary care, endocrinology, having the awareness of the new guidelines is going to be the best way to solve that. So like where I'm going to be going for practice, we have an endocrinologist and it's a very collegial environment being a smaller hospital. So having those conversations with the radiologist at like tumor board, et cetera, hey, we're seeing these, let's not overburden the system with the costs and kind of make the awareness. But I think as a role of surgeons, we love surgery, but this is a, potential topic, especially if endocrine is a lot of what you're going to be doing in practice, it's important to have those conversations and advocate for the health system and reducing costs. Okay, Dylan, I have three questions, yes. so try to remember them all. My first one is you said that you need to correlate, correlate your pathology with your initial diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Of course, we do that a lot in breast as well. So my question is, is that just saying, yes, it's a benign adenoma that may be functioning or not versus it's a cancer? Or can the pathologist tell you it's a pheo and tell you it's an aldosteronism, aldosterone tumor, or tell you it's a cortisol-producing tumor? They'll be able to tell a little bit of that, but the main reason you're wanting to make sure is you're like the 5% risk of the malignancy for adrenal cortical carcinoma. That's going to be the majority of reasons why you're doing an adrenalectomy. And you want to make sure they don't have cancer, okay. which is so the whole you don't really care about the about the specific cell type as long as long as it's benign you, you versus do. malignant. Yeah, you do, but it, it's more of a pathologic. Like, is this more of a, a cancer? Okay. And, and then, then you talked about with prolonged surveillance for people with pheos. Could you clarify? Is that a local recurrence of that pheo? Is that a new pheo? Is that a why? Or, why do we need to do this? Yeah, be more of a local recurrence, to my understanding. But fields can be multiple, can they not? They can, yeah. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, that's one of the things when people have MENs, which I hate MENs, which because you mm -hmm. never see them in our every exam, and I'm going, why do you do this to us? <laughs> but um, that they, you know, multiple pheochromatitomas is one of the things you're you're looking for on those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not. I think. I mean, I guess. I guess if I would have picked an answer, I would have said that it's more likely to be a new one somewhere else yeah. than a local recurrence. But yeah. Okay. And then what was my third question? Well, my third question was about the epic stuff and finding things. Um, are you talking about they'll be able to be searching the radio? I know they can do that. Right, searching the radiology report, but right now, for us to do any kind of study on it, somebody would have to put it into the problem list, correct? So that's part of where the AI would automatically populate it as a problem. Okay, it's, can we tell it, AI not the, to put things in that aren't problems obviously. anymore? Say that again. I just get tired of these people who have 57 other problems yes. <laughs> on their list. No, I mean, I guess that was my question because, I mean, that's one of the things I would say to people. I see people all the time who get sent to me with breast cancer, and nobody's put that in on their problem list as a problem. Yeah. You know, so somebody has to do that unless you're going to have AI do it. And if you have AI, you'd have to be smart enough not to overwhelm the problem right. list too. But, yeah. yeah. And trust but verify just because it's there. Yeah. Right, right. That's mm -hmm. a real thing, yeah. But I think this is, I mean, this would actually be an interesting thing for us to look at in our system. And especially now that we have an endocrine surgeon here, mm -hmm. how practice changes, you know, from pre-Dr. Machado to post-Dr. Machado. Right. I think theoretically with that, it wouldn't necessarily ideally just toss in a diagnosis. It would say, okay, have a, a physician review. Does this patient indeed have that? 
and then you can review the images, but at least flag it for review kind of a situation. Yeah, thanks for presenting. Um, I'm ready for take outside again too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so kind of stemming off of Dr. Strom and Dr. Machado both, so I was crunching some numbers back here. Our catchment area, at least for trauma, 600,000-ish. So 100 or 12,000 people in our catchment population will have an incidental loma diagnosed at some point in their life. Yeah, 60, 60 trauma patients a year should have an incidental loma because we have about 4,000, 3,000, 3,000 ish um, admissions a year. That's mm -hmm. folks that are likely to get a CT scan. So what is the proposed pathway? I don't like the radiologists improving their language in our reports, as you know <laughs> how I feel about uh, that department. Um, so what's our proposed pathway for our system then? I think just having the awareness of it and looking because there's so many incidental findings that we identify that the radiologist doesn't make comment on sometimes. So just doing a double check of those areas, like I like to anyway. And then... And that, that's not something that institutionally can be set as in stone. It's kind of like an individual preference. But I think doing having some discussions would be worthwhile because it's not just adrenal lesions. It's all sorts of findings on CT scans that... I'm sure it's across the board, very poor follow-up sometimes. So I think, I think it's a, a potential easy, low-hanging fruit PI project for somebody who wants to jump on it of what our numbers have been um, of incidental lomas in the past and then our referral rates. And I'm sure they've been abysmal um, in terms of workup of trauma patients. I mean, just think about population in general of them not being ones that are being high likelihood for any kind of follow-up, let alone for something that they don't understand, that we barely understand on imaging. Um, so I think having a very definitive pathway that they can't fall through the cracks electronically or in person, get the, get the functionality ruled out, whether that's inpatient or not, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I guess that's the question I would have. I, similar to how we manage splenic vaccines, ideally we wouldn't do spleen vaccines as they're leaving the hospital, but we do because we want to catch 100% of the patients. Right. And so how do you do that in this world? And then how do we show survival benefit for our population moving forward too? Yeah, I Probably think good. that's that's the big question because I think even like pulmonary nodules or different things that we find incidentally, unless we're diligent about putting that in the problem list and at least telling the patient bare minimum, there's a lot that gets missed, unfortunately. And nothing's more disheartening than radiology scan says there is this lesion six months later, it's metastatic disease. Like, I mean, not always does it do that, but that's very disheartening. It's like they had it clearly stated and sometimes it doesn't get to follow up. Now one, is that the patient or is it the healthcare system that unfortunately didn't help them? So just really quick, I wanted to answer Dr. Hewn's point because he makes yeah. a really great one. Mm -hmm. um, I think the answer cannot be uh, just we need to communicate more because things will fall through the cracks. Yeah. It needs to be automated and it needs to be on a systems level. And so ideally what this would look like is this would look like you find an incident loma on the trauma service and it reflexes to an order set. Mm -hmm. And the order set in an ideal world, if we had endocrinology at NGPG, it would be really simple. Mm -hmm. We don't. So until that happens, that order set can say reflex referral to endocrine surgery because these patients yeah. do not need a workup inpatient. In fact, most of your screening tests are going to be positive. When they do need that workup is two to four weeks after they leave the hospital and they've gotten over their acute trauma. Mm -hmm. And then you need someone to review the imaging, do confirmatory testing, and set up surveillance. And so it's doable, and I think it really is low-hanging fruit for our PGY1s and 2s that need QR projects. This is a great thing to look at. you know. But we can automate it, and we likely should, so we're not missing 60 incidental ones a year that need to be evaluated. A fine uh, and a, a comment I would like to make. Um, you, know, you had mentioned how in the U.S. open adrenalectomies are still standard of care for adenocortical carcinoma, and I think this is a, a, a pattern of growth for all cancers. Uh, there was a time we used to advocate for open gastrectomy, D2 lymphadenectomy, D3 lymphadenectomy for mm. gastric cancers. There was a time uh, MIS and hybrid or totally robotic 
esophagectomies were debated as whether they're truly appropriate or not. And then when you show them, you can send patients home in four to seven days. It just changes the paradigm. Uh, overall, I would say a robotic or an MIS adrenalectomy is way better compared to an open adrenalectomy, not just in terms of surgical outcomes, uh, but also in terms of um, surgeon um, you know, comfort. Mm -hmm. It is a horrible operation. A right-sided open adrenalectomy or left-sided open adrenalectomy are terrible operations, which I would never like to perform. <laughs> and, um, and if we are having a lot of local recurrence, it just usually just means we need to stay well away from the adrenal gland and take tissue around it. That's my, my feeling. And I'm certain over the next few years, um, uh, an MIS adrenalectomy will be acceptable as a standard uh, for adrenal cortical carcinoma. And I would strongly say that if we have adrenal cortical carcinoma cases in our hospital, we should perform them MIS rather than open. Very Thank nice. you. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Great <laughs> job. Thank you.